We actually say trauma-informed yoga is human-informed yoga. So we deal with chronic and acute trauma, but also just like everyday stress, right? And we respond to it the exact same way. So when the body is stressed out, the neural pathway that you're experiencing stress, whether or not it's a level one or a level 10, whether or not it's real or whether or not it's perceived is happening the exact same way in the body. I'm your host, Derek Van Der Walker, and for the month of March, I'm honored to present the Warriors at Ease series on Guys Talking Yoga. Warriors at Ease is a nonprofit with the mission of bringing the power of yoga and meditation to military communities around the world through training, advocacy programs, and partnerships. They've developed, through research cultivated with the Department of Defense, a methodology and technique to help individuals learn how to connect with their own sympathetic reaction to stress. And it's not just a military condition. This is really human beings in general. In modern life, we spend a lot of time with our mind and body disconnected. It's not necessarily an issue or an illness, but it's really just coming back to who we are and reconnecting with those things in our lives and ourselves. To kick off the series, our guest today is Christina Hickey, the Executive Director at Warriors at Ease, who's been with the program since 2017. In this conversation, Christy shares an overview of Warriors at Ease and their unique approach to using evidence-based, trauma-sensitive yoga, meditation, and breathing practices to help empower military veterans and first responders to connect with themselves and their communities. This is going to be a great one. So Christy Hickey, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Derek. I'm excited to be here. So we've chatted a couple of times offline, but I just want to say I'm, I'm really excited to have you on the podcast to talk about what you're doing with Warriors at Ease because I was blown away earlier this year reading the study in the Journal of Military Medicine about how yoga that was tailored to the military community was having a significant impact in helping those people deal with PTSD and manage those symptoms. And I think, you know, that's one of the pieces of what this podcast is about, not just helping get guys into yoga, but also I think highlight a lot of these studies and research that is out there and bringing that to the forefront and being able to have a a great conversation about how yoga is changing lives. So really cool to have you here. And thanks again. Thanks so much. I can't wait. So what is Warriors Ease? Because I came across you guys when I was reading that study and I said, I got to talk to this group because you guys are the ones behind all this research and all this great new stuff happening around yoga. Yeah. So we started back in 2009. Our co-founders were the instructors in some of the original paid research studies that were done in Walter Reed for the DOD and then in a couple of different VA clinics in DC as well as in Miami. And so what they found was that not only was this practice creating an incredible difference, helping in these particular studies, it was combat veterans deal with both visible and visible injuries and illnesses, but also that it really needed to be, we say tailored or military specific, but what really happens is we take all of the excess out and really just introduce this practice in a way where all we do is move and breathe. And we really strip it down to the absolute basics of what it is. And so we call it like taking out any of the flowery or the woo-woo language and really get down to exactly what are we doing and why are we doing it and not trying to add in what we would call author and experience for other individuals, but really just welcome into the room, whatever experience they're having or will have. So obviously some of these things take time to roll out. But somebody at some point said a lot of veterans are coming back from their experiences overseas they're dealing with a lot of complex mind-body issues and trauma. And somebody connected the dots and said, yoga might be a resource or a solution for helping these people find their path and reconnecting. And it's not just about strengthening the lower back, or it's not just about losing weight. This program's all about bringing that to the military community, but obviously other people are benefiting from the research and your mission. So... One of the things that we've really noticed is that, and this is the human condition, this is not just the military condition. In modern day life, our mind and our body are disconnected. And it's not necessarily like an issue or an illness, but 
it's really just coming back to who we are and reconnecting with those things. So Warriors at Ease, what is its mission? What do you guys offer as far as services or programs or training? So the mission of Warriors at Ease is to bring the power of yoga and meditation to military communities around the entire world through training, advocacy, programs, and partnerships. And the main way that we really do that is through our training. So we train expert level service providers. There's three tiers. So level one is really understanding the research. So we take hundreds, like absolutely hundreds of research studies. Our level one training is about 276 pages of pure research and understanding advanced anatomy. So if you're like a data nerd or like an anatomy nerd, it's absolutely fascinating. Again, hundreds of research studies, understanding really the power of the practice that it has and almost reconnecting with your passion as a yoga teacher to see all of this stuff on paper. Like we knew that it was powerful. It's why we became yoga teachers. But when you see it on paper, you're like, oh, I was right. This is real really exciting to see with the level one teachers, but we learn about our evidence-based techniques. And so what's really interesting is you can't actually say that yoga is an evidence-based practice. Interesting. And who says you can't say that? Research. So the practice of yoga, as we know, has a ton of different postures and thousands of ways that it's presented. And it's never going to be done exactly the same even if you're practicing the same postures, like it's always going to be different. Because it's so subjective, you can't say it's evidence-based. And so there's been all of this research, but we can say is that different techniques are evidence-based. And so we have our core warriors of these techniques that are evidence-based. And you learn about that in level one. And what's really cool is not everyone who takes the level one training has to be a yoga teacher. We train hundreds of clinicians, service providers, therapists, social workers, PTs, OTs, you name it. Interesting. So level one training is not a regular 200 hour teacher training. Mm -mm. It is more like an elective that somebody who does have a 200 hour or 500 hour background can take to really learn about some of these techniques that have helped a lot of veterans with finding that mind body balance again. And therefore, lots of people are coming in there, not just yoga teachers who want to layer this on, but there's people coming to this stuff because the research and the curriculum that you created is so helpful to a lot of different types of practitioners and people in the healthcare and wellness community that see the benefits. So we actually say trauma-informed yoga is human-informed yoga. So we deal with chronic and acute trauma, but also just like everyday stress, right? And we respond to it the exact same way. So when the body is stressed out, the neural pathway that you're experiencing stress, whether or not it's a level one or a level 10, whether or not it's real or whether or not it's perceived is happening the exact same way in the body. And so we have a ton of different external scans and they're happening all the time. So we are constantly scanning our environment for safety. And we have a filing cabinet in our brain of every experience we have ever had. And we know what it looks like, what it smells like, what it feels like, what it sounds like, all of the above. And if anything happens, literally anything that looks like, smells like, feels like, sounds like, acts like, one of those times where we were stressed out or we did have a traumatic event, we will have the exact same response because we're designed to survive. And so what happens is certain parts of the brain decide like, oh, this might not be the safest environment, trigger, fight, flight, or freeze. And this is why I really appreciate the work you've done because many can benefit from yoga on a lot of levels. Many can benefit from the research and the programs that you guys offer because like you say, trauma is just a key part of the human experience. And if your brain and your body is super hyper vigilant, you got your guard up because you're on the six train in New York and it's not the best hour to be on the train or you're stuck in traffic on I-95 or if there was just something that happened right next to you that stressed you out, the body still responds to that threat and that danger the same way. And you guys have developed a methodology and technique to start to connect how to manage that sympathetic reaction to stress. Absolutely. So what's fascinating, and there's a Viktor Frankl quote 
movement, it says that there's a space between stimulus and response. And within that space lies your ability to choose. So for those who are listening, Viktor Frankl wrote one of the greatest books ever, Man's Search for Meaning. He wrote it during the Holocaust when he was in one of the prison camps. And he realized after losing half his family and many of his friends, that those who had a sense of purpose and meaning in their life could get through anything. And so that book is born out of that experience. But to your point, Christy, it gets down to being aware of your emotional reaction, your fears, what you're assuming and choosing. Or just your physical reaction, because it could just be physical. Like you don't even know it's happening and you're like, oh, my heart rate just went up. Great point. We're not even thinking about it and you're freaking out, right? Yeah. So you guys have realized this is such a common theme with those in the military community. You've got your level one program, which is more about laying out the foundation and the evidence and the techniques. What's the level two program? So level one typically is done online. It's hosted on Yoga International. Once a year, we do a level one and level two in-person training at our affiliate yoga school. And it's also a two-acre wellness facility located just outside of Fort Bragg called the Guiding Wellness Institute. And then level two, so it's always in person, and it's the practical application of the techniques, and we layer them into our trauma-informed protocols. And our trauma-informed protocols really have to do with this idea of welcoming an experience, as well as the adaptive advanced anatomy. So taking the postures and really breaking them down to our, our lead faculty member calls them primary efforts. So really understanding what and why we're doing this posture, like exactly what and why we're doing this posture for this population and how are we going to introduce it? Absolutely every single one. And how are we going to layer it through these different places? And one of the big things that they learn how to do is actually we introduce a sympathetic response in our classes. And then we bring it down. Interesting. Yeah. So we're actually like introducing this little bit of like elevated heart rate, this sympathetic experience, because then we're refiling how these individuals react to that sympathetic response without them even knowing. That's interesting. So before we go any further on that, and I know you are an experienced yoga instructor, you've designed programs and curriculums with the Air Force and the many different other communities. What would be an example for like how? you would bring this into a yoga environment or a yoga community? That's a tough question because every time we design a class, it's different. Like every single time I look at my population, like you have the class you plan to teach, the class you taught and the class you wish you taught. But for the general population, I would say you are going to leave that class feeling more empowered and successful than any other yoga class on the planet. Because the techniques that you guys have done helps them make the connection between what their senses are picking up and their mind's ability to choose and find balance within those perceived threats? Or how does it actually, like, what would be an example? The way that postures are introduced is from simple to complex. We very rarely use yoga posture names. And actually very rarely do we use traditional yoga postures. They take on this whole new light because they're being adapted for every single individual in the room. And the beauty of this practice is that if a teacher is introducing it, sensory enhancement, so like understanding this connection between the mind and the body, the students don't even necessarily need to be aware that they're doing it. It's just going to happen. And when they get done, it's kind of like, I don't even know what happened, but I feel great. I'll actually give you a a personal experience for my students. I have a group of clients that I teach a private class to. And it was the second class that this individual had ever taken with me. And we get done and we sit up and they're just like looking around and like tears. We call it leaking of the eyes, tears. And they were like, I have never been in a class where I have never felt like I was trying to keep up, I was doing something wrong, or felt so at ease at the end of this practice. Like I didn't have to worry about anything. I didn't feel like I was lacking. 
And so that's the essence of what we do. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, it sounds like it, to really understand and feel what you guys are doing, you sort of have to do it. You have to kind of be a part of the training or be a part of one of those classes to really feel it. And it's interesting. We were talking about an example where sometimes men, but anyone, could be in a yoga class. Something's going on in the class and they're doing this. And all of a sudden, somebody just gets up and leaves because they're like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I was thinking, you know, most yoga instructors might want to spend a half second and try to grab them before they leave and be like, you know, you, you know, everything okay or this and that, or if you tried this. And you were like, no, no, the way we do it is that they just get up and leave. That's their experience for how they are participating or processing all of this. And that's their own natural reaction. And so they have to step away and walk out. That's what they do. Yeah. So part of what our teachers learn how to do, we call it safe container. When they are even introducing themselves to the class, they will go through, if you need to get up and leave, please feel free to do so. They also have a team. So this is part of their post-training certification is they have to write an eight-week program. And so our teachers have to have up to five different contacts for that location that are on call for mental health, physical health, you name it. And all of that stuff is introduced at the beginning of class. It's done super quick. So if somebody needs to leave, they know that they're allowed to, they know who to reach out to, they know where to go, what needs to be done. And who are we to decide that they're getting up and leaving because they've had a negative experience? They may have literally just figured out life's secret and they're like, all right, I'm done. I had enough. And it happens all the time. Like people can come to one class and they're done and they've figured it out and they've integrated it and it will last for the rest of their lives. That's awesome. The other thing we talked about was how there's a little bit of two different camps in yoga classes, those who want music and those who don't want music. And one of the things that you mentioned that I thought was really insightful in, in the experience that those in the military community deal with when they are deployed and overseas or in a military environment, especially when they have the enemy around them, either nearby or in a distance. And you said many of them are not good with silence because that's not a good sign in their experience in the military world. So could you just speak to that for a moment? So both deployed and non-deployed, the military is a constantly moving and changing and adapting and dynamic environment. So there's always communication, always. Like that is number one. That is the biggest thing you learn how to do in the military is how to communicate with your team, regardless of whether or not you're deployed or at home. And typically there is a calm before the storm. And usually when it's silent, you're waiting for the storm to happen. So when it gets quiet, we start to really listen. And then we're in this protective mode where we're waiting for the storm to come, for the danger to come. And then that we call it like a, an IV of cortisol. So that when we get into that state, when we're waiting for the storm to happen, our sympathetic nervous system is on call. And we're just getting constant little drips of cortisol that are saying, all right, whenever you're ready, we're here. And so silence can often be of not the best experience for rest. And it doesn't always have to be music. A lot of what we teach, because depending on the circumstance, you absolutely never know where you're going to be teaching within the military community. I am dead serious when I tell you I taught in the middle of a combatives cage. We separated it. And like I was on one side, combatives were happening on the other, but it was also surrounded by a weightlifting gym. So when you say combatives, what are you describing there? They're learning how to fight. So it's a combatives cage. If you've ever seen a UFC cage, it's the same thing. It's just huge. So I taught in a combatives cage. And so we couldn't have music, but there was also like tons of stuff going on. And so your voice is an anchor. And so typically within these communities, and it can change if you've been working with this community for quite a while, but typically we either say music that doesn't have a sort of Middle Eastern flair to it. There's no lower pitch, not super dynamic. A lot of the times we use like very basic guitar music or sometimes a little bit of electronic. And then also during what we call as yoga teachers, savasana or final rest. And like I said, in Warzities, we actually don't use any Sanskrit. 
And we very rarely use typical posture names. So we just call it final rest. And you guys do have to remove some of people's own biases and thoughts about what those things mean, just make it more accessible as far as just like, you know, you don't have to really get hung up on some of the Sanskrit names. And there's multiple layers of that too. So there's this whole like yoga and religion thing. Like there are a lot of religions that have adopted yoga, but yoga isn't necessarily a religious practice. It can be if people choose to do that, but we try and remove the stigma of religion, but also this like inaccessibility of like having to understand a different language. And it's a little bit woo woo, but also savasana or corpse pose isn't the best thing to introduce into a military setting. Yeah, right. Totally. Yes. And so we call it final rest. And we always offer a guided body scan or a lot of our teachers are IRES trained. Um, so IRES is like our sister company. We really specialize in the asana and pranayama where IRES really specializes in meditation. And really the beauty of what happens is when these teachers are trained in both. So when you were sharing with some of that with me, the challenges silence can be for some of those in the military community, the choices you guys make in how you communicate your techniques, your curriculum, your program, super thoughtful, super designed to know and understand and try to get in the mindset and the emotions of those you're trying to serve and support and making in a way where they can learn to really get into their body and mind and emotional state and work through that trauma by making that as accessible as possible and familiar and comfortable. It makes, it, it makes a lot of sense. Let's take a minute now and speak to this great series of episodes we're going to have on Guys Talking Yoga, partner with Warriors at Ease to highlight your mission, but also speak to the experience men have with yoga. So if you could tell us a little bit about what we're going to be doing here together and some of the folks that we've invited to join this conversation. Yes. I, it's, an incredible group. It's a very diverse group of individuals too. And so I think one thing that we were really focused on when we were picking these individuals was getting absolutely every viewpoint that we could in this short span. And so I think that that's going to be really beneficial to understanding the depth of what worries these is. So we start out with our three trauma-informed protocols. So we've got preparation, integration, and restoration. And today you and I are speaking about preparation, which is really laying the foundation for understanding what all goes into this, um, creating the safe container, so to say, or welcoming every experience that will come into this series because you never know. And all of them are true. And then we will talk about integration. So like I said, in the middle where we kind of introduce this sympathetic activation and take all of the different techniques and layer them on top of one or another, creating an imprinting effect. That's really what happens in integration. And then we have restoration. And then we move into really the pillars of warrior's disease and what we're trying to achieve. I and mean, we've got health and resilience and connection. So overall, physical, mental, emotional well-being through these asana and pranayama practices. And from that health comes resilience, our ability to bounce back. And then from health and resilience, we get this sort of connection piece to the community around us. And then we've got resilience. And then finally, for our connection, we will have a Worsity's board member, Dr. Vince Arnold. Dr. Arnold has over 20, maybe 30 years of active duty service as a chaplain. He's been involved in not only the research side of things, but also in the delivery side of things. He taught in clinics, he ran family retreats, everything for years and years and years, deployed multiple times overseas as a military chaplain. And I got to tell you, I'm psyched to have a chaplain on this program because I think it's very hard and can be awkward and very personal talking about spirituality. And there are people who are quote unquote religious and they, they're very traditional in their religion and they practice it in a very structured dogma and doctrine and all that stuff. And then there's people who say I'm spiritual, but not religious, but regardless, everyone at some point should be able to put their struggles into a meaning or a story or a narrative that helps them not only just get through the tough days, but also enjoy the great days. And I think 
it's hard to talk about spirituality in general, but it's hard to talk about spirituality and yoga. And I'm very excited that he's going to join us because I've always wanted to continue to try to find a spiritual conversation, a part of these interviews, because we can talk a lot about how yoga helps with back pain and knee pain and sleep. And we could talk quite a bit about the mental health benefits of yoga, but the spirituality is one it's hard to talk about. So I'm really looking forward to talking to him. So I've got a question for you about from your perspective, having worked in this program and worked with many different types of men in this context, but also having interact with many men in the military community. You come from a military family. You're married to a man who's currently serving our nation right now. What do you think are the barriers of entry for men into yoga and the challenges that exist in them being able to sustain a practice? Barriers of entry, a lot of yoga studios in general, and it's very interesting that this is the way it's happened. Teachers are predominantly female and like the typical version of a female, like I hate to say it, but like tall, skinny white girl with blonde hair. Right. And sometimes that's not who you relate to. And the way that it's even done on social media, I mean, same thing. It's like, quite girly, very flexible, like this spiritual sense of things that are going on, like getting into shapes that are not possible for 90% of the community. Usually on a mountaintop or with the Pacific Ocean behind you or on a cliff, right? Yeah. Not where I used to teach, which was in the middle of a combatives cage that was surrounded by a weight gym or in a conference room. Like it was one of the two. And so I think that the, just the way it's presented to the general population is not accessible. And that's one thing that we definitely need to fix like as an industry. And so a part of what we also do is try and make our teacher base more accessible. 100%. And I think, like you said, people want to see people like them doing things to affirm that it's okay to do it. And I think more men need to be teaching, more men to be doing yoga and just showing them that this is stuff that you should be doing and you're going to enjoy it once you get into it. You might not enjoy it at first, and that's okay. Well, that's true, but you got to keep coming back. <laughs> that's that's the sustainability part, right? Yeah. No, it's, so for sustainability, I think it's really, I mean, very similar to women. We have kids, we have schedules. It's super expensive. And like being in a room full of just like a bunch of women who you don't relate to that are flexible. But... A lot of that has to do with the way that practice is introduced. And that's why the sustainability of the practice rides on the shoulders of the provider or the teacher or the instructor. And that's actually what makes Worries These different. There's all of these organizations that are really dedicated to just making sure that the practice is paid for, is scheduled, is ran. Like Worries at Ease is dedicated to ensuring that the service provider is able to introduce the practice in a way that's accessible and sustainable to the entire community. And that is where the sustainability comes into place. Because if somebody comes in and they're like, I couldn't do half of what this person said, like I wasn't welcomed, all of these things were introduced in a way that I wasn't successful. Like, if it's not introduced in a way where students are empowered, so empowerment is also part of Safe Container, that's why posture is from the ground up or from the foundation up, the primary effort up, so that everyone feels successful, no matter what. And so really, it lies with the service provider, and we as teachers have to take on that responsibility. That's great. So my next question is, Christy, what do you love about what you do at Warriors at Ease and its mission? Oh, that's tough. How do I put it into one? Bringing together our teacher network and seeing the magic that they make happen. All this preparation, all this integration, all this connection and seeing it all happen on a larger scale. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Christy, it's so great to connect with you. I really appreciate the enthusiastic response you and Aslan had to my email when I reached out to you guys to talk. I'm very excited about the conversations we're going to have. So thank you again for joining us and thank you for doing what you do. Thank you, Derek. I can't wait to see the end. 
You know, it seems that mitigating the stresses of life requires either extreme effort or quick fixes. And let's face it, sometimes stress leaves us so tapped out, it's easier to just sit on the couch with a beer and veg out in front of the ball game. We're all trying to dodge stress in the tougher aspects of life. And Warriors at Ease invites us to sit with that experience and learn how to work with it and not against it. Our next episode is a great conversation with Mark Velker, who had a 20-year career with the Marines flying Cobra helicopters. And Mark shares one of the most valuable techniques we can all use when facing adversity and stress and challenges in making better decisions. Stop, breathe, wait, think, and choose. Mark shares those thoughts and a whole lot more, and I know you're going to enjoy that as well. Make sure you subscribe and follow us on Instagram at GTY Podcast. 